and we need to bring stuff in here. I don't know if Maureen's on it. No, she so wants to. Yeah. All right. So I'm ready. Ready to do this. Mm -hmm. I was having trouble ringing the freedom bell for some reason today. We're just going ring, ring, ring. Hi, everybody. Hope you had a good Memorial Day weekend and that if you were out and about, you uh, physical distanced and uh, wore a mask if that's your persuasion. And I guess didn't if it's not. I don't know. I, I kind of hope you did. But uh, gosh, everything nowadays is controversial. Well, we're not controversial. We're doing the cool stuff here in the National Federation of the Blind of Colorado. Thanks for joining us. In just a few minutes, we will be joined by John Perret, but we have a few of our usual announcements. Um, the first one, I went to nfb.org looking for something today, and I got caught up in perusing our website. And I'll tell you, I don't know why we don't, and I think we don't, use our National Federation of the Blind, nfb.org website, way more than people do. Oftentimes, I'll ask somebody a question and I'll realize if I had just looked at the website or somebody will make a point in a chapter meeting and I'll go, if we had only checked the website, that thing is just absolutely flowing, overflowing with resources and connections and information. So I, I just, I spent a good deal of time looking at the National Federation of the Blind website today and I urge you to just go through it. There's so many, all the press releases and monitor articles and you can read kernel books and you can learn about the free white cane program and i don't know how many people get for example imagineering our future which is the monthly newsletter that president riccobono and his team put out so you know when folks say you know how do i learn about this in the nfb of course as members we want to tell them but on the other hand that nfb.org website is a pretty special website. Uh, so I wanted that to, to call that to everyone's attention. We are now seven weeks from the national convention. Free registration. Go to nfb.org and uh, register for the convention. As indicated prior to the call, we'll be meeting with our team tomorrow and figure out how many of these Mountain Time at Five calls we will continue to put together with your suggestions and ideas, and we appreciate those ideas, so keep them coming. It is likely that either next week or the following week we'll reduce this to a three-day-a-week mountain time at five schedule, uh, and we'll keep doing it as long as there's interest and as long as folks have topics of interest to members of the National Federation of the Blind or other people who are blind that we might want to uh, you know, topics that you think we might want to talk about. We've got a great one today. Jessica, do you have uh, comments before John comes and joins us? Hang on. Just... Yeah, I think she's talking, but I think she's muted. She's she's in hibernation. She's yeah. in... Am I unmuted there now? You, there you go. Yeah, Sorry, no. I might have actually muted myself to keep my background noise down since I'm not in the room with you guys. So I did want to just talk a little bit about some of the calls that we have coming up this week. We're going to have a really great workout Wednesday tomorrow. We are going to do a great all levels cardio workout to kick Ooh. things off at five o'clock. And then at 545, we're going to do an advanced ab workout. We've done one advanced ab workout. We're going to do a different one this time. So that one's going to be really fun. And that's going to kick off at 545. So you can join us for that if you'd like. On Thursday, yeah. we are going to introduce our NFB of Colorado scholarship class. And I noticed just looking at names on here, one of our uh, NFB of Colorado scholarship <laughs> winners, Karis Glather, is on here tonight. Yay. So you're going to hear more from Karis as well as our other NFB of Colorado scholarship winners on that call. It's going to be a great opportunity to get to know those folks a little bit better and really uh, get to have opportunity to hear from them that sometimes we don't get to hear from them um, when we meet them at our national convention. Um, not all of our Colorado folks get to know our Colorado scholarship winners as well. So this is gonna be a really fun and great opportunity and I'm really excited about that session. And then on Friday, we're gonna have Philosophy Friday 
Uh, Kevin, I don't know if you want to give us any hints about what that's going to be about this week or if you want to keep it a secret. Oh, we'll keep it a secret for now. We have a couple of ideas percolating around. People have sent, if you have ideas for things you'd like to talk about, the National Federation of the Blind Philosophy, its implications and guiding principles for today, what would that be? You can send us an email, and that email you can send to... Uh, what is our email address? Assistance, assistance yeah. at nfbco.org. Yeah. That's assistance at nfbco.org. And just a reminder for folks also, if you have any COVID-19 related issues and you're in Colorado, uh, you can email us at assistance at nfbco.org or give us a call at 303-778-1130, extension uh, 219, and that is our COVID-19 hotline. And uh, also, you can call that same number if you are having any guide dog-related issues with either Lyft or Uber. That's another option that you can call that number if maybe you don't uh, aren't quite as familiar with how to fill out the NFB surveys online, or maybe you didn't have time and you just want to call and jot it down somewhere on the hotline and have one of us get back to you, we're happy to do that. So we have a great guest coming up today. He's not quite with us yet, I don't think, but you guys, he's going to be great to fill us in on a lot of the legislative that we're working on, as well as some of the implications of the CARES Act and how that might apply to blind people. So uh, we're going to get John in here shortly. Uh, in the meantime, is, is Scott uh, make the call today? I know he was I'm here. There he is. Scott, we're waiting for John Perret. He had a another call that was going to make it really, really tight for him, but he'd be trying to be on here by five after. So uh, why don't you uh, regale us with any NFBCO presidential comments you might have? You want me to filibuster a little bit? Maybe uh, that's no, no, I really that, don't. That would be <laughs> having a governmental yeah. affairs discussion. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, well, welcome everybody. I what yeah. is this, Kevin? This what week eleven? Yep, week eleven, baby. That is just astonishing, and it's it's just today. One one thing I discovered is uh, with our newsline service. We are actually getting the data from Johns Hopkins before anybody else. Uh, and I just noted this afternoon that according to Johns Hopkins, uh, our death toll in the United States has now exceeded 100,000. So it really was kind of a sobering, grim reminder of what we've been going through uh, and I'm afraid that it's, you know, we're just, we're, we're not even, <laughs> probably not even in the middle of this yet uh, in, in terms of how long we're going to be dealing with this. So I think my sense will be that we'll be doing these calls for many more weeks. Uh, and anything we can do in the NFB to make it easier to get through this time, to have the camaraderie and, and and share with each other, I think is just critical. So I wanna once again, take my hat off to Kevin and Jess and Maureen for being the principal organizers of this and really helping us through this pandemic. So I don't know if John is here yet or not. John, are you here? We've tracked him down. We think we have John Frey. John Frey, is that you? That guy. John Frey. Uh, you got to accept the unmute. You got to accept the mute or the unmute or whatever. Otherwise, you're still a mutant. There he is. <laughs> is that John? Reminds me of uh, when Andy Williams was trying to talk to Stevie Wonder in 1971 in the Grammy Awards. Stevie Wonder was in South Africa on some civil rights issue, and Andy Williams kept saying, "Can you see on the satellite? Can you see me, Stevie? Hey, Stevie." <laughs> <laughs> Stevie, 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 I don't think has ever seen him. Uh, Kevin, I can't see you. Right, right, right. No. Trying to get John in here. <laughs> and we may have a technical issue. 
As, if John can hear us, I, I was going to encourage him not only to talk about our governmental affairs programs, but to tell us a little bit about himself, yeah, uh, and I'm gonna do how that. he got involved and how he came to be the guy that he is. The guy that he is. The man among the men. legend. The legend, the scholar, the <laughs> influencer. You know, he had a bar. A lot of people don't know he had a bar in Baltimore for a while. Did you know that, Scott? If you're talking about the one recently, yes, I yeah, did know about it. a little neighborhood bar. People might not know that John Perre owned a bar for a while. Well, he actually didn't. He was helping some pro some buddies of his with a zoning issue. And because he they didn't have any money to pay or whatever, he was helping them, you know, just free gratis. And uh, they had a bar, so he could pretty much go through the bar and, you know, make a drink anytime he wanted to. And... Uh, he used to tell people, oh, yeah, yeah, this is my bar. This is, he took me and Jessica there one time. I think it was Jessica I was with. You, we, we you want to go yeah. to where everybody knows your name. Yeah, you go to John's bar. Uh, <laughs> but he says he doesn't have it anymore. So uh, at any rate, guys, thanks for hanging in. We're trying to sort of figure out what's going on. I know John was going to try to be here by 10 after to fill us in on some of the things that regarding the CARES Act that have to do with blindness, the ATA, some of the other stuff that we're doing. Uh, in the area of governmental affairs. So I imagine uh, we could take, or what are we trying to do, Kev, now? Are we uh, stymied here? Or? They muted and unmuted. They muted and unmuted. Yes, so right. maybe. Is the Ann Marie Laney? Is that? Yeah. John, are you with me? Oh, somebody's dog is there. <laughs> Ann Marie turned John into a little puppy. I'm tired of this John. <laughs> I knew she was powerful, but I didn't realize. Yeah, she's uh, she was an amazing woman. <laughs> she, uh, I think, has transformed our director of government. <laughs> <laughs> and now we now into a bigger dog. Now, of course, that has two of our girls all hyped up. This is fun, y'all. I'm so uh, sorry, guys, for the inconvenience. What we could do, I guess, is uh, take some questions about because we have regular callers. People may want to know have questions about anything going on the National Federation of the Blind or NFB of Colorado that they may have on there or opinions that they may want to share. Scott Labar, our state president, is here. Jessica's here. I'm here. And while we figure out uh, where John is, uh, if he has indeed been turned into a puppy, uh, uh, by the wily and wacky Anne-Marie Laney. Oh, here we go. John, are you with me? Oh, there he is. John? He's got to, uh, you can unmute, you can John, unmute John, John. Accept the request. Accept the request to be unmuted, okay. my man. Hey. I was muted there for a second. I'm sorry I'm late. No, you're good. You're fine. We're He's having, here. We're having some fun. Uh, I'm glad she turned you uh, back into a man from a puppy. You can ask her about that later. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, the man of the hour, the guy we've been talking about and waiting for, he no longer owns a bar, but he is way engaged in leading our governmental affairs efforts in D.C. and across the country. Here's our colleague, John Perre. Hi, John. Hi, Kevin. It's so nice to be able to speak to you. And uh, uh, you organized such a fantastic uh, event last week that I was on. It's just an honor to be here tonight with you and, and the, uh, the other listeners. Yeah, it's great. So Scott was saying, we know we want you to talk. I've talked to you. You want to talk a little about AATA and all the governmental affairs stuff. But Scott was saying before you got on here, maybe we ought to con you into telling folks, just a little more about the personal side of John Perre, uh, a little of your story and uh, how you got here, and just uh, tell us a little about John Perre. I didn't ask you to do that before the call, but I'm asking you now, so just do it. All right. I'd be happy to do it. All right. So let's see. I am uh, 61, hard to believe, but true. Yeah. And probably about 25 or 30 years ago, uh, I was working in uh, Virginia out of sight of DC in what's known as the Tyson's Corner area and had a sales job and was doing quite well. And I suddenly noticed that my eyesight was diminishing. And I went through a process that I've now learned many NFB folks have gone through. You go sort of to, to one eye doctor after another and they try to figure out what's the story. And after a couple of years, uh, I learned that I have cone rod retina degeneration. It is uh, incurable and degenerative. And I uh, it got worse to the point where I lost my driver's license. 
And, and I didn't really know, I didn't know any blind people. So I started, I didn't know how people did things. And so as I lost my eyesight, I did less and less uh, finally. And I sort of gave away my responsibilities at work to other people to the point where one day the company called me and said, because uh, I was in a remote office and they said, you, you have two choices. You can either uh, resign or I guess it was really, really get fired or you can go on disability. Well, going on disability seemed better than getting fired. So I said, I'll go on disability. And I thought that's, you know, that would be the right thing to do. And I started doing that. And I thought, well, I can now be on disability anywhere. I don't have to stay in Virginia. And so I hadn't lived in the same city as my parents for quite some time, mostly as an adult. So they lived in Tampa, Florida. So I moved to Tampa, Florida, not too far from them, and, and decided I would spend the rest of my life in Tampa, Florida, pretty much doing nothing, because that's what I thought blind people did. And at least that's, and that's what I was doing. I had a lot of time on my hands, so I started listening to, I found out about NFB Newsline, and started listening to Newsline. I'm very interested in the news, and especially financial news, and then I uh, you know, would listen every day, day after day, and dial in, it always say a service of the National Federation of the Blind. So one day I decided to look up the National Federation of the Blind and I started reading information on the web and I was very intrigued. And I learned that there was uh, uh, chapters. And in fact, there was a chapter meeting in about a week, about a mile from where I lived. And so I I went to the chapter meeting and after all these sort of years now, I met another blind person. I met a bunch of blind people, only they weren't sitting at home doing nothing, kind of feeling sorry for themselves like me. They were all active and had jobs and families and activities. And I thought, oh, I've made a horrible mistake and I want to be I want to be like all you guys. So I threw myself into the uh, NFB, the chapter, and the NFB of Florida, and Newsline, because I love Newsline. So I started getting very organ uh, involved in actually helping to run Newsline at the NF for NFB of Florida, which actually got me a trip up to the National Center, which uh, made me, so I got to meet people like Jim Gashel, and Dr. Maurer and Betsy Zaborowski and uh, later Mark Riccobono. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is just, uh, again, I've just made a horrible mistake. I can see that uh, if I have the proper tools, technology and training, I can succeed. And so I uh, actually ended up going to Washington Seminar and that was really something that was just, I just love Washington Seminar. I love the politics, I love the activity. I really got along well with Jim Gashel, uh, who actually then invited me up for an interview, which was interesting because I never thought I'd work again. And I interviewed uh, with Dr. Maurer and he offered me a job, which I accepted on the spot. And then, um, in fact, that same day, I started looking for a place to live. Next day, I think I found a row home which I'm in right this moment. I, I've been here now, lived here for 15 years. This is now the longest job I've ever have, I've ever had. And I, I've lived continuously, you work quite near the NFB, so that there, there's just no question that the National Federation of Blind has changed my life uh, forever and for the better. And that it's interesting that it it's so, uh, integral to NFB Newsline is what, what drew me in. And then, uh, oh, it's a little ironic there because my first job was to work on Newsline, uh, which I did. And um, I can leave through a couple of my jobs. Should I keep rolling through that, Kevin? Yeah, keep rolling through Newsline and then let's switch over after a few minutes to uh, some of the things we're working today. But yeah, you worked in beefed up Newsline and, and, and uh, have been doing it for 15 years. And then yeah, so I, was, did, 
I uh, worked on Nudist Line and yeah. uh, that was extremely exciting. Uh, and then uh, what happened is after a couple of years, we started to do the work with the KNFB Reader. Yeah. This was quite some time ago. And we wanted to do more to publicize our KNFB Reader work and formalize our public relations department. So I got to put in charge of public relations and uh, worked for Jim Gashel for public relations. And at that point, we hired Scott White to run the, the news line work, which he still does. Yeah. And I did the uh, public relations for a couple of years until uh, we decided that uh, due to a number of shifts of Jim Gashel uh, moving to Colorado at the time and getting more involved, actually working for the Kenneth B. Reader Company uh, and uh, Dr. Betsy Zabrowski getting very sick and then, and then later, unfortunately, passing away. Uh, there was a, quite a reorganization and I became the executive director for what at the time was called Strategic Initiatives and now is Advocacy and Policy uh, to do the government work, which is also kind of what pulled me in back on that very first meeting that I did with uh, Jim Gashel uh, there in the appro where appropriation that actually helped get the money for the KNFB reader that uh, he and I just ended up in the same sort of the same meeting. So uh, that that kind of leads me to where I am today and and have the honor to uh, to work now with so many I know of the people on the phone and with uh, Kevin uh, doing so much with Kevin has been always a uh, Kevin with you has been a great honor. Well, it's been great for us. You know, before you got on here, just so you know, we did talk a little about your bar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I did. I shared with people, you know, that'll teach you to be late, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no. So, uh, so now, now your hands are full, right? I mean, with this pandemic, the National Federation of the Blind continues to lead the way on several fronts that really does affect the advocacy and policy team. Yes. Well, we've had to kind of review the three issues at Washington Seminar. We probably have about 10 issues, irons in the fire. At Washington Seminar, the three that we focused on this year, I don't want you in, in any way to think that we only have three issues. It's just the three that were most timely that President Riccobono decided, you know, that we should try to move forward this year uh, along with the other things. But the three were the Access Technology Affordability Act, the GAIN Act, uh, with greater accessibility and independence through non-visual technology, uh, and then the uh, AIM High, Accessible Structural Material in Higher Education. Those three uh, bills we started moving forward on the Access Technology Affordability Act. That is one that has really become even more essential and urgent with COVID-19. This bill would create a refundable tax credit for access technology, specialized things like refreshable braille displays, screen reading software, screen magnification software, embossers, uh, and things like that. All very expensive, all things that, that only blind people have to get to make really the underlying technology work. And the credit would be $2,000 uh, for use, you get it over a three-year period. So you could use it all sort of year one or use it a little bit each of three years. And on fourth year, you'd have sort of another 2,000 that you'd, that you'd get to use and it would continue like that. So you'd be able to keep building up or refreshing your technology. And the refundable part means even if you don't pay taxes, uh, it, you, you could have a zero income you would file a tax return for the amount that you paid and you'd still get a refund for that amount. So if you had no taxes, and this is a critical part of this because a lot of people today, when you want to get a job, you have to use the search aggregators on the internet. So you'll need to get on the internet, use the internet to search for a job. So if you don't have the technology, how are you gonna search for the job? And then when you need to, then you have to apply for the job almost always online. And then even to keep your job, you need to have a certain amount of technology in your home 
uh, which is what the focus of this is. This is technology that we want the blind person to own him or herself to have in their home to do the things that they need to do from their home, whether employment, you know, it's to get a job, retain a job, education, uh, work now that, as I said, COVID-19, so many people are at home, don't always have the technology they need for education. This could help fill that gap. And then, and this independent living, so many people now are, are at home. And so the need for this is that much greater. And so it, while we started it, not tied to COVID-19, I think there's a, the COVID-19 clearly shows that this is absolutely needed. We are making progress because of members and members of the National Federation of Blind calling uh, their member of Congress doing classic advocacy. Uh, we're up to 91, if you check congress.gov, so if you just go to www.congress.gov and then look up the house, which is HR 2086, and then there'll be a button that says co-sponsors, you'd see that today there's 91 co-sponsors, you can see each name. If you go over to the Senate, uh, S815, and search for that, you'd see there's 22 uh, senators, and uh, we're trying to get by Friday to 100 co-sponsors in the House. We think we have three more that um, are about to show up on congress.gov, so we're about to jump to 94. It's realistic that we could get six more because uh, we know so many people across the country in Colorado and everywhere else that everyone knows that we're all working as a team and, and it's that sort of team spirit all working individually, but knowing that while you sit there in your home typing up that email, that there are dozens or hundreds of other members sitting in their living room typing up this email to try to get their member to co-sponsor this legislation, which really John, would- let me, let me jump in real quick and say, guys from Colorado, we're a little weak. It looks to me like we have Negus on this bill uh, from Boulder. I think he's the only one, unless I'm missing something, that we have from Colorado in the House. Uh, I know we have a couple of folks on here from Colorado Springs area, so Congressman Lamborn, you guys ought to call his office. Those folks in Colorado, we can do this during this week to get a hold. This ATAA is important whether you're employed or not employed. You know, think about being able to spend a couple of grand, even if you're on disability or SSI or whatever, to get that money back that will empower you even more than you are through that access technology, John. Absolutely. And you know, we have three people from the Freedom Caucus uh, that are on the bill. One of them is uh, Matt Gates from Florida, who has been spending a lot of time with the president. So whether you are, are sort of more for, far right, or even there's been, there's some very people that are more far left, because it's not about your sort of that political, whether left or right. This is people who say, yes, I want to give blind people the tools to help them succeed and have the opportunity to help succeed. And ultimately, we think that the bill will really pay for itself by having people increase taxes, people getting jobs, paying taxes, uh, getting off of Social Security, and, uh, and even paying into the Social Security system because they'll have to pay FICA. So the bill, it, it really is something that it's not really a matter of party. It's, it's about how do we improve opportunities. And by doing so, we improve not only for blind people, really, but for all, for all Americans. Because do folks have questions for John about AATA? We'll move on to some other matters, but we'll see if anybody wants to raise their hands. I think we're, we might have questions about AATA or practice or procedures. And then I know John will have some other updates. Sure. For us. Who do we have, Karen? Uh, we have Chelsea Cook. Chelsea, go ahead. You're going to be unmuted here. Yeah, there you go. There you go, Chelsea. Go sorry, ahead. Sorry, one more time. One more. Push it again, Chelsea. There you go. There you go. Okay. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Um, this just actually came to my attention. Just something when you mentioned uh, when you mentioned Braille displays. Um, 
do you know if this gets if the ATA gets passed if that will cover um, the extended warranties for them because I I long okay. story short I had to what yeah okay yeah good question. all right yeah would if you probably if you bought the extended warranty at the same time that you uh, purchased the product then I would say yes some of those details those are that's a good question and it might depend on IRS regs that would come out subsequent to the bill getting passed. So probably yes. What else do we have? Nobody else. So far. No one else? Okay, John, you want to move to the next item on your list or go wherever you want? Sure. Now, let's, all right, so now that you've heard ATA, I want to kind of talk a little bit about the, uh, which is COVID-19 related activities. So the first thing we, uh, we had all the issues I talked about at Washington Seminar and all the issues we have, which I can come back to. We pivoted a bit and said, what do we need to do, uh, listening to our members, to uh, related to COVID-19? So the first thing people kept, members of Congress and others were saying, we need to help put more money in the people's pockets. Well, for people with disabilities, one of the fastest way to put more money uh, into people's pockets could be you know, knowing that so many people would be uh, losing their jobs, many people were losing their jobs, would be to change it so that the waiting period, if you go on the SSDI, the five month waiting period for your benefits and the 24 month waiting period for your uh, Medicare coverage, that those were both changed to zero. I mean, there's really no reason that we should have any waiting for benefits or Medicare. And certainly we don't need to, shouldn't be having the waiting periods during the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're urging Congress to temporarily waive. I mean, we love it if they would permanently waive it, but to keep it more COVID-19 specific, we're urging that they temporarily waive uh, the waiting periods for SSDI so you, you this, the day you're eligible, determined eligible, you'd also start collecting your benefits and you'd get Medicare coverage. Uh, we're, we're urging the, that would fall under the Ways and Means Committee. So we've had mostly meetings, which would be phone calls and emails with members of Ways and Means and in the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, so that would be one if, People have questions that don't, I, I can go to the next topic. Anyone have questions on the uh, possibility that we could get the SSDI, and I, I don't know about SSI, eligibility waived immediately so people can get on the darn thing. So you're not have to wait forever, not the eligibility, but people who are eligible. Uh, I think we should just waive eligibility. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You still, yeah, you still. All right, all right. So then let's go. And we can tell people raise their hand. Let me know. All right. This, there are six things. That's number two. Number three. All right. Uh, Randolph Shepard vendors. Now it's interesting what happened to Randolph Shepard vendors. You sort of have two categories. One category would be the folks that were doing, say, military troop dining, or the post offices, or interstate rest stops. They uh, kept up, keep uh, kept operating, and in fact, really, we're sort of on the front line. So they are helping make sure to keep the country safe, the company operating, to keep the supply chain going, and so those groups uh, were really working hard. Folks in those situations, uh, you had another group, which is probably the larger group, who suddenly found out that their government building was closed and it was they were locked out and at this point now they've been locked out for quite some time uh their inventory is probably either uh you know all the foods and things the food nature is expired other things are out of date and so uh they have no customers the income it's it's a huge problem so we would like to have uh one is uh two waivers that wouldn't cost anything just two waivers the first one is when you, in the Randolph Shepard situation, you uh, uh, 
state program will pay for your initial inventory. Well, this is almost like, like starting over again. So when they come back, we're saying that you should be able to, the government should be able to, state government, state licensing agency should pay again for your initial inventory. That would be a reasonable thing. And we're just actually, the problem is, it's not clear that the state licensing agencies, even if they wanted to, if they have that latitude. So we want a waiver so that they could if they wanted to. And so in Colorado, state, real quickly, in Colorado, the state agency wants the waiver and they're hoping that the secretary will allow the state agency in Colorado to, to actually buy recover inventory. So we're hoping that happens. Good, excellent. And the other has to do with uh, fair market, uh, fair minimum return. Uh, the folks, there's a provision to do that. And uh, there's some waivers there. So uh, I won't go into all details on that unless Kevin probably knows more about than I do. But the, uh, those are the two waivers that we're seeking. There's also, we're hoping to get an appropriation to help money, to distribute money to state licensing agencies, but then, then could be extended to do things like the uh, inventory, because it, it, some of the states, while they want to do it, if we got the waiver, they don't have the funds. Other states have the funds, they really just need the waiver. So there, there is a, an appropriation there that would go with that. How are, we, how are we doing on that? Are we still working on the 35 million that the, uh, the feds could then decide how the states, uh, the feds would then somehow, RSA would distribute that to the agencies to, to yes. rebuild yeah. their programs? And how are we on that? Are we, is there any possibility of getting that done, John? Yes, so well, absolutely, yes. I mean, we have to keep pushing, keep advocating, keep urging, and uh, there's a letter that uh, you, I don't have the website right in front, but you can go really probably to the uh, National Association of Blind Merchants and there'll be a link to where you can get a, sort of automatically get a letter sent very quickly or some other things to help urge your member of Congress to support this idea. And I urge you to do that. And the, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop for a second and digress slightly. So the House has passed the HEROES Act a couple Fridays ago, maybe only 10 days ago. And that's a very large partisan bill. Uh, it's only, only Democrats voted for it, but it passed. One Republican. I think there was one Republican, John. Oh. Yeah, one guy. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. I think you're right. All right. So that um, has been sent. So that was passed by the House, sent to the Senate. And uh, uh, Senator McConnell said uh, that it's dead on arrival. And of course, I would say, you know, when the, when the House passes something and the Senate starts talking about it, and you might think, well, what does that mean? Well, that means they're starting to negotiate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's there's an open gambit on each side. But that, that's how th these negotiations start. Uh, they start far apart, and hopefully they can come together and find something. Thoughts are that this one's going to take longer. The, uh, the previous bills, it, there was clearly more urgency, and I think this one's going to take longer. But all of the people I talk to on both sides of the aisle say that we will come to an agreement. It's a little unclear when, so I mention this because uh, Kevin, this means that there is absolutely still an opportunity for us to get these items incorporated in, into whatever is the next coronavirus legislation, sometimes referred to as C4. And don't think that just because the House passed something that that, you know, that we're locked into that. We're not in any way locked into that. That's really just the beginning of the negotiations. So there is still an opportunity, but we're going to have to move fast because people are thinking that this negotiated version could start to get locked down sometime in the month of June. Uh, you, you can't be sure, um, but we, would, we really need to make substantial progress on all these things in the month of June. So I'll be in my office tomorrow if any folks interested in Randolph Shepard want to work on a Colorado strategy on the 35 million as well as 
uh, getting the Secretary of Education to sign off on these two waivers. John, uh, other than the Randolph Shepard stuff and AATA, which we want to try to get considered in this legislation as well, because it is related to COVID-19, other than those two areas, what are the current things that those of us who are members should be doing to support the work you're doing there now? Okay, the fourth, all right, number four, and that's, that's near and dear to Colorado and, and to the entire National Federation of Blind, is we need to get more money for centers, our training centers. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we are urging that a, a grant program be established uh, to do that. It would not, so it's not an earmark, because uh, it's really, Congress isn't doing earmark. So it would, it'd be a grant program, so it'd be money, that be given to the Department of Education that would fund grants uh, that would be very specific to uh, training centers for the blind, residential training centers for the blind. We actually have a number of adjectives that we use that would help uh, guide the money to centers like ours, but not, not just the NFB centers. It's, it's other centers that do uh, high expectations with structured discovery, which there's some other ones in the country that do that. So uh, we are hoping to make sure we, you know, we have the country as a treasurer. Our centers are a treasure that we can't lose. And the teachers, you know, it's not, it can't be replaced. And there's so much that we've invested to have our centers. It's critical that we keep them operating and it's gonna be more challenging with, uh, with uh, funding for rehab. So we wanna make sure that there's funding to keep the centers going the way they are. That's number four. Uh, next would be the uh, IDEA. The next one is sort of easy. Initially, there was discussion that Secretary DeVos, Secretary of Education DeVos might propose some waivers that we would be against. Right. So number five is just really monitoring that there's no waivers that we feel would uh, degrade education for people with disabilities and for specifically blind people. At the moment, she hasn't recommended any waivers that we're against. So that's more just a monitoring so number five is monitoring of the main, thing, the main thing there though guys is just to make sure that no quirkiness happens because we don't know how long online education and other resource uh, challenge will will confront csdb our school for the blind or public schools whatever wherever blind kids are getting educated wherever they're getting those education uh, we don't want secretary devos or that department or anyone to say well in the time of pandemic, you know, we're just gonna be too challenged to provide fill in the blank, braille, cane travel, technology, history, whatever they wanna say. So we have got to remain vigilant. And that's really kind of what you're saying, right, John? Absolutely, you, you hit it spot on. Okay, good. The, and last would be, uh, not, not least, but maybe even most important, important is voting. We have to make sure as we move, so many place states are moving to either what we refer to as absentee voting or no excuse voting or vote from home, uh, all the same thing where you're gonna vote by mail. As we move to that, we gotta make sure that it is accessible. So, uh, which we, for example, here in Maryland, there's a tool that you can download that marks your ballot. So you use your computer to use uh, go through a web like interface to mark your ballot and then you print it and then you mail it in and so uh, that would be it's it's all non visually accessible uh, it is it does require that you have that equipment so along with making sure that states offer that states must also offer in person voting you can't you can't go to the point where uh, you don't have the opportunity to vote in person if you need to vote in person because of uh, most uh, the polling places do have and need to continue to have accessible voting machines where you can vote in person. Uh, now in Colorado, we have what Maryland has, I guess. We were uh, sharp enough and, and had the 
savvy people and the resources to go to the Capitol and uh, working with Curtis Chong, who brought the, a lot of those ideas from New Mexico and working with our president, Scott Labar, we got some wonderful legislators to understand. They didn't know about COVID-19, but they understood that in Colorado, we were a progressive state moving away, moving much and much you know, toward uh, voting by mail, voting absentee, we still have polling places, but all of our elections now are vote by mail, and we do have the capacity to do that in Colorado. Fantastic. So the, the key is that a blind person in America should have, must have the ability uh, to vote privately, independent, a secret ballot, using a, a non-visually accept, uh, accessible voting method. Yeah, uh, we have a letter. There's a really nice letter from President Riccobono that's on our uh, NFB.org that really lays out what we're looking for, and it has the sentence. He he actually uh, wrote the sentence. That he told Congress just put this sentence in any bill that you pass related to voting, and it will help protect the rights of blind Americans. And um, in the in the bill that I described that the uh, was the Heroes Act has nearly the sentence that President Riccobono wrote. Uh, so it looks like they came pretty close to doing exactly what we asked for. We're urging uh, that they improve it a little bit, come closer to exactly what we suggested. And so we're working very hard on, on that topic. So those, those are sort of the six things that suddenly, or so only the first one we were already doing, and maybe the voting to some degree where we are already doing, but those things suddenly are absolutely urgent that we, that we try to get done. And we have a real shot at doing here in the next uh, bill. And, and that, in fact, that's the key because of the, uh, the covet bills as you went from C1, C2, C3 that have gone through, we need to make sure that this next C4 uh, contains the things I've described. There's discussion that there could be a C5, but you can't count on it. So we, we have to kind of assume that there won't be a C5, and let's get it, let's get it into C4. We will work on it, and we'll spend some time, maybe have some special government of, uh, governmental affairs calls to plant some strategy or uh, to develop, not plan, but to provide, discuss, develop strategies at the grassroots level here in the National Federation of the Blind of Colorado. Do we have any hands at this point, Kev? Anybody want to pop in? Because I have a couple of things still before we get to the bottom of the hour. Uh, if you guys have questions about any of the work we're doing, you can raise your hand in the usual ways. And uh, by the way, on the call on Friday, folks, we're going to be using the polling feature uh, of Zoom a little bit. We're going to conduct a few polls. Uh, I've been on some calls where they do some polls. If you're on the phone uh, using the, the call-in feature, you can't participate in the polls but we'll find a way for you to participate. You just won't be able to vote secretly, I guess. Uh, anyone, Kev? Scott. Scott Labar. Yeah, uh, thank you, John, for uh, joining us uh, tonight and uh, for all the hard work you do. Uh, I can't wait till we can see each other in person again and share a gin and tonic. Um, okay. uh, but I, I just wanted to take a moment to let people know uh, that with regard to voting, we have actually an election coming up here in Colorado on June 30th, there is a primary election. Yep. And you can go right now to myballot.sos.colorado.gov, enter your information, your, your name, your county, and all that kind of stuff, and you can see what your ballot will be. Starting on June 8th, that ballot will be live and real. You can fill it out online. Print it out, sign where it tells you to sign, put that in the envelope that you will all be receiving. Everybody's going to get a mail-in ballot. Uh, you can put that, what you printed out, in that envelope and send it back to your county clerk and recorder. I uh, really urge, 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 urge everybody to stay at home, vote by mail, and use this wonderful accessible system that we now have. Yeah, it's important that we do it. You know, the Secretary of State's office, we've had two Secretary of State's, a Republican and a Democrat, who have worked with us very, very effectively. Uh, and particularly the current administration has been very effective, as well as some legislators, Jesse, Jesse uh, 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 
uh, Danielson. Danielson. <laughs> <laughs> and and Pete Lee, I forgot. I always get Jesse Danielson's name mixed up with another Jesse friend of mine. So I always hesitate. Anyway, Jesse Danielson and Pete Lee, uh, and uh, they've been just great uh, advocates. Uh, so, yeah, we got to make sure we do that. Because if we, if we ask the power structure to do something for us, then we ought to use the infrastructure that they uh, establish with us. Um, other and obviously, the system will be in place for the general election in November. So, right. okay, let's hey, use it. Any other comments for John Pere or Scott or anyone else on the call? Marianne. Oh, Marianne Miguelli. Mary First of all, thanks. Thanks for all the hard work you do, John. Uh, governmental affairs is definitely not easy work, and you run your feet off, and you run your and you run your phone like crazy and so on and so forth. And uh, all the messages and the updates that we get, uh, <clears throat> none of us should be taking it for granted that somebody else is doing that work. But I wanted to say, because I know people will pull these calls down from YouTube and for folks, do you want to give a quick sort of overview of what Washington seminar looks like and or what does it look like to make the call to Congress? Sure. Uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about Washington seminar that we just had. So uh, we, the National Federation of the Blind, have uh, really a week on, on Capitol Hill, which we refer to as, as Washington seminar, where we come together to educate members of Congress on legislation that we would believe would help to improve the lives of blind people. Uh, that legislation that we're going to do usually gets uh, sort of determined in the November, December time frame. So the November, December time frame of this year, we'd be trying to decide what we're going to do for the upcoming January, February. Uh, President Riccobono, uh, in consultation with the Board of Directors, uh, determines what those priorities are. And then we, uh, the affiliates, uh, make appointments to meet with their own members of Congress. And so, uh, and we have Colorado certainly is uh, exemplary in their uh, making their appointments and getting organized and making sure people can tell stories and their personal stories and understanding uh, what to do. And in fact, uh, you, you've got so much leadership there in Colorado that frequently you actually help some of the other states that, uh, that have newer people that haven't had as much experience yeah. so that we can have a really good team effort. And then uh, we have various trainings. We have a headquarters hotel, which is really fun in that we get to visit with uh, prob about 500 other members who have come from across the country and we uh, have a kickoff meeting that typically occurs on the Monday, the beginning of the week, which we refer to as the Great Gathering Inn, which usually has about 500 of us there. Uh, this year we had uh, Congressman, Chairman, really, Chairman Bobby Scott, the chair of the uh, House Education and Labor Committee, he came and spoke. So we had a very senior member of Congress. The year before, we actually had Senator uh, Grassley come. He's the president pro tem of the Senate. He came and spoke to our event. That was an interesting story is when he came that year, you know, the president pro tem is number four in line for the presidency. So you have the president, the vice president, the speaker of the house, and then the president pro tem. So he has a uh, pretty significant uh, security that goes with him wherever he goes uh, in terms of sort of secret service protection. And I had texted the person that was gonna be with him and said, now, I didn't realize he was gonna have all this protection. So I said, you know, we need to, know he's coming so as you leave the office and you're driving and you're with him can you kind of text me so we'll be prepared uh when he gets there so i hadn't got any messages yet and we're there and uh 
somebody comes in to the stage and said, John, there's two Secret Service people outside. They want to say hello. And I went out and talked to them. And they said they were the uh, pre-team pre, pre uh, team that had gotten there early. And he was going to be there after a bit. And so I talked to them. And I would kind of go back and forth. And after a little while, I got the text. And it said, he's leaving the Capitol. So I went out to the two guys and said, and just in case you wanted to know, uh, S Senator Grassley's leaving the Capitol. And one of them said to me, sir, we knew that. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, they seem rather irritated that I was telling them what to do. All right. So, well, you know, uh, let me just say, John, real quick that, the, you know, our guys, uh, the majority on here in Colorado, although we have people that join this call from all over the nation, but only a few years ago, our, uh, our own uh, Michael Bennett, Senator Bennett, joined us for a, a great gathering and gave us a rousing, a rousing uh, address, which is always fun to work with John's department to organize those, those luminaries that come. And it shows you how powerful the National Federation of the Blind membership is that you can call on a sitting United States Senator who's the Senator pro tem and uh, he'll he'll come and bring Secret Service and, and talk to your folks. That's pretty good. Yeah. Stuff. Well, kudos to NFB Colorado. But we've only had two senators in probably the last 20 years, uh, Senator Bennett and then and then Senator Grassley. So uh, and then we've had a few pretty senior members on the House side. But yeah, but getting a U.S. Senator is quite an accomplishment. Uh, we then have hundreds of meetings on Tuesday that, that members have made with the 535 members of Congress. We have, they spread over Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And uh, so that goes extremely well and people get to meet with their member of Congress and, and talk about the issues and so forth. The uh, many times you're meeting with, with the actual member, the uh, Elected official, sometimes you're meeting with staff. Uh, staff can also be very important. Staff play a very critical role because there's so much legislation that the members can't uh, keep up with all of it. And they, can, they can frequently rely quite heavily on their staff. So convincing the staff to be supportive can be a, a very important uh, step in, in getting support for our legislation. And then we, for the last couple of years, uh, we've had the reception on Tuesday night, which really this past year was really the banner reception. We had uh, from five to seven, I guess maybe it was five to 6.30 for an hour and a half in the Kennedy Caucus Room, which is one of the most uh, historic uh, conference rooms, holds about 250 people uh, in the uh, Senate, in the most historic, it's in the original Senate office building the Russell Senate office building. Uh, and there's a plaque on the wall that talks about uh, the various uh, hearings and other things that have, that have occurred, really historic things in that room. And we had 15 members, four senators, and uh, 11 members uh, of the House of Representatives. Wow. 15 members came and spoke to the group. Wow. And so we, uh, between the two evenings, we really had, along, along with all the actual meetings that we had, so it was really uh, stupendous. And we do that really in sort of partnership with the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers, now called Auto Innovators, uh, because of uh, the good relationship we developed with them back with the Pedestrian Safety Enhancement Act. And now because of their desire to work with us with autonomous vehicles, which was interesting because this year, that morning, Tuesday morning, uh, the Congress had a hearing on autonomous vehicles and had four people come speak. And one of them was President Rico Bono. So Tuesday morning in the morning, he testified on the House side on uh, energy and commerce regarding the benefits that autonomous vehicles would have uh, for people uh, for blind people and talking about the importance of making sure that they're non visually accessible. So we were, uh, we were everywhere. You seeing hundreds of blind people with their white canes and guide dogs, but uh, taking all over the three house office buildings and the three Senate office buildings and 
and being in the capital is just so exciting. And we're, we're very noticed in a good way. People know, uh, realize it. Many people uh, remember us from year after year yeah. that we come and they, they're impressed by our ability to come and clearly articulate legislation that could be beneficial. I think that, yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think that if you've never gone to a Washington seminar, uh, I know some people that will say it's their second favorite activity of the year after national convention. I even know a couple of people said because it's small, uh, three days, four days, more intimate, it's like up there with their favorite NFB activities that they do all year. And I don't want people to feel overwhelmed by it because we have fun. We grab each other and we'll, we'll bring you along if you, if you are struggling uh, you know, traveling over that huge capital, you know, I don't know how we're going to do it from now on, but we usually just say, take an arm and we'll, we're, we're going together. I take, take a six feet stick, I guess. I don't know, but it'll be interesting. You, you know, we're going to be living in a brave new world. That's for sure. And I don't know how all the physical distancing will work in the future, but I can guarantee if you go to with a national federation of the blind to Washington seminar, you will have a pretty spectacular time. Even if you don't care about the government and the politics like John and Scott and I do, <laughs> you still have a good time. Uh, any other yes. questions? Yes. Jessica, you got a hand raise? Somebody has a hand raise. Is that Jessica? Kevin? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so she's on she's talking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we did. Just really quickly, I want to echo, I love Washington Seminar. I think it's amazing to have the opportunity to go and really feel like that you're being heard by the representatives that you vote into office and that we are making a difference for blind people all across the country. So it is one of my very favorite things to do and I would encourage anyone to try it out. And John, I wanted to just ask you really quickly, for someone who does so much, you must have to do an awful lot to keep yourself healthy and fit. What do you like to do for exercise and eating well? <laughs> well, uh, I am vegan and uh, try to follow a whole, uh, whole food plant-based diet. And also I am uh, a fanatical walker uh, using Fitbit. And I uh, probably uh, last week, Monday through Friday, I think I said a personal best because I walked a hundred thousand steps uh, Monday through Friday. So, nice. uh, so what's that like five miles? Is that five miles a day right there? Twenty thousand. It's a little 10, more than that. Yeah, ten miles a day. I ten did miles 50 a day. Miles, yeah, Whoa. fifty miles over five days. Now, that doesn't compare to. Uh, some of you that do 50 miles in one day. So, uh, but I'm, I'm well, that's not on. that often, though. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't do that every day unless you're Jason Romero running across the country. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, you're a vegan and you're a walker. And so far, we're kind of with you over here. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I guess I'd just say thank you for all that you do. We are coming to the end of the hour. And I know that if people have questions, they can email you or call you or call your department and you're ready to put us all to work. Uh, all true. Okay. Any final thoughts from you? Uh, it was an honor to be on this call and, uh, and to be able to speak to all of you. And it's a huge team effort. Many of you, uh, maybe everyone, I don't know everyone on the call, but it's a huge team effort. It's all about the team. And uh, so to keep, keep we, if you, uh, as, as Kevin said, if you haven't been doing so much, uh, we, we need your help. Uh, we can't do it without you. And uh, as you knew, I, I uh, at one time was not so involved. And so if you're not so involved in the National Federation Fund, I urge you to become more involved in the NFB. You don't have to jump right into this. There's a lot of different things and you have really great leaders in Colorado. So many have, you've just heard from. So uh, I, I urge you to, to contact them or you're welcome to reach out to me. My email is jparee, jparee at nfb.org or call the National Center at 410-659-9314 and my extension is 2218 and when I'm not there it will roll to my cell phone.
John, thanks for doing this, man. We appreciate you. And I'm sorry you don't have the bar anymore, but it was fun for the few weeks that you took me there. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Right. Great workout Wednesday tomorrow and meet the scholarship winners on Thursday and Philosophy Friday, Friday. Thanks, everybody. And good night from Mountain Time at 5.